shall like trumpets be blown in the city, and the people be not afraid. If there's calamity in a city, shall not Yahuwah have done it? Therefore take heed how you hear. And Yahuwah said to me, Proclaim these words in the cities, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. That is to put them into application. For Yahuwah has named you a green olive tree, beautiful of good fruit. Shalom Mishpoka of Yahuwah, and welcome to another Restoration of All Things message. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. The time of Sukkot is upon us. Praise be to Yahuwah. As we celebrate Sukkot and the light in all its splendor and awesome significance, most treat it as common in ignorance from not knowing Yahuwah's paths and the right way of order. Sukkot, this is a time of the end, for it is yet for an appointed time, for an appointed Moed. We are to make preparations now the storm is arriving. This message is for the Kodeshim, the set apart who keep the law of Yahuwah and those that are coming in into the sheepfold. The time is at hand, which was spoken by the mouth of the Navim of Yahuwah for such a time as this. Now is the time that the trumpet shall sound. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Besides this, the hour has come for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is near to us now than when we first believed. Baruch Atah Yahuwah, Malek HaOlam, Abba Yahuwah, I come before your feet in humility and with a sincere heart. I ask you to give me boldness to proclaim your truth for such a time as this. Father, I'm praying for the Kodeshim who are without a doubt being tested. Give them strength. And let the words that you have given me encourage them to finish the race as they sojourn through the storm. In Yahushua's name, Amin. The enemy is usurping Yahuwah's time, and he will reset time before the great and most dreadful day. Meaning there's so many smoke screens to keep you off balance, to stumble you, to keep you off the right order. And most that are not in the way or in the truth, are not preparing as they should be. They think that what's coming is for another generation. No, this is the last generation. This is the last generation that Enoch wrote to in his book. Satan, Hasatan, will reset the time before the great and most dreadful day, meaning they are fake smoke screens as you have been seeing and end time scenarios that are at play right now. Deception is rampant in our day and will continue towards a crescendo until the appointed time set by the Father. While the majority cry out for revival, the spirit and power of Eliyahu is restoring all things in preparation of the way for the bride to make herself ready. Those who have answered the call, the true Messiah is being revealed, which has been hidden since long ago. The remnant are the dry bones with the authentic Messiah in them, and they are to proclaim the truth, to proclaim the way, to proclaim His name, and are restorers of the breach of the covenant that has been broken so that the lost can have life and more abundantly. Therefore, fulfilling the great commission in Ruach and in truth, which means casting out demons, feeding the hungry, and healing the sick. Where are we in Yahuwah's timeline of the spirit of prophecy? Are we in tribulation? What's meant by Sukkot? Was Messiah born on Sukkot? And how does Ephraim fit in? Are you part of the restored sons of Zadok, the congregation of the righteous remnant? All these questions will be answered today. And again, Father has impressed me that this message is, is for those who are set apart, for those who call upon the name of Yahuwah, not by name only, but in action, in devotion, in full reverence to Him, who walk the walk and are known by their fruits. However, it is also for those who are being awakened by the Ruach of Truth and are coming into the sheepfold, as Messiah foretold long ago. 
And these are the ones that are practicing the dress rehearsals, the Moedim. If you don't practice the Moedim, the dress rehearsals, the set times, you will not be ready for the bridegroom. Beloved, the Devar Yahuwah is alive and takes on the past, present, and future tense of the word. Nothing new under the sun. It's a wheel within a wheel, a work within a work, that if anyone told you, it would not be believed. The storm is coming. The storm is here. It's arriving. It's on its way in full force. In the near future, after the storm has passed, which is the tribulation, we will say Messiah has come during Yom Teruah. Gather the Kodeshim from the four corners of the earth. And on Yom Kippur, he established them as Yasharal in one day. The nations have been judged. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And the bride has made herself ready for Sukkot. For it is a time of rejoicing. Shaul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 8. For indeed, if the shofar gives a confusing trumpet call, who shall prepare himself for battle? And today, this is what we have. We have different shofar blasts, different shofar calls, diverse teachings. So cry aloud and do not hold back. Listen to the voice of the trumpet, Yahushua, and prepare for Sukkot. Prepare your temporary dwelling, which are your temple bodies. Prepare for battle. Prepare for the storm that is arriving at this very moment. Make preparations now. Yes, indeed, this is a message of urgency. A trumpet call. A shofar blast from Yahuwah. I want to show you some clips so you can see what I see. So you can see and you can get a better grasp of what I'm talking about. And so you can fully understand that the enemy has been working hard throughout our lives and operating in our faces. And we have been giving him full consent. The spiritual war is now manifesting in the flesh. And this is the perfect storm that is arriving. Soon, if not already, you will see demons manifesting in people. You will see visions. You will see things that you have never seen before. You will hear of things you have never heard before. While at the same time, Yahushua is revealing all things. The mysteries are being revealed so we can get ready for His coming and not be taken by any wind of doctrine. The enemy is preparing themselves. They are preparing themselves hard. They are preparing themselves for the final battle while most are in slumber. So how is your preparation going? So um, we have to prepare for a more angry world. And uh, how to prepare? Uh, it means to take the necessary action to create a fairer world. Let's also be clear. The future is not just happening. The future is built by us, by a powerful community as you here in this room. We have the means to improve the states of the world. Well, I think maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing they will remember from the COVID crisis is this is the moment when everything went digital. And if and this, is, this was the moment when every, everything became monitored. That we agreed to be surveyed all, all the time, not just in authoritarian machines, but even in democracies, and maybe most importantly at all, this was the moment when surveillance started going under the skin. Because really we haven't seen anything yet. I, I think that the big process that's happening right now in the world is uh, hacking human beings, the ability to hack humans. Is the European Union on its way to becoming a surveillance society like China? It's already under attack in the European Parliament is something that would be ripe for government abuse. Clearly we are witnessing right now the Chinification of Europe. Because we see what is happening in China right now with the social credit score, where the government is monitoring and uh, surveilling all the people from the beginning to end. Everything that they do, everything, everywhere where they walk, every, it's every, you know, they control everything and they, they, they watch everything. This is the example of a tyranny. 
The EU insists the digital identity program will be voluntary. Skeptics are wondering how long before it becomes mandatory. Not only are digital IDs coming to Europe, but in Italy, the cities of Rome and Bologna have begun social credit programs that reward citizens for behavior that officials think will fight climate change, like using a bicycle instead of a car. A social credit system could be easily incorporated into a digital identity. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Sustainable development has become the popularized expression for Agenda 21. It is the agenda for the 21st century you're living in today. For a brave new world where everything that you cherished and held true will no longer exist. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. factor reinforces the other, resulting in a perfect storm. We're facing a food pricing problem in 2022 that's creating havoc around the world. Well, if we don't get on top of this thing quickly, and I don't mean next year, I mean this year, you will have a food availability problem in 2023, and that's going to be hell on earth. Tonight, sabotage at sea. That's what President Biden is calling the leaks and explosions along the Nord Stream pipelines. The Russian gas lines are essential. They supply 35% of gas from Russia into Europe. They've been attacked, and Nick Robertson is out front. Like a boiling cauldron, the busy Baltic Sea bursting with gas from ruptured Russian Nord Stream reinforced pipelines. Russia and Ukraine together produce 30% of the world's wheat supply, 28% of the world's corn exports, and more than half of the world's sunflower seed oil, which is used to make vegetable oil. Together, they used to export an eighth of the food traded worldwide. Then there are fertilizers. The UN says Russia is the world's number one exporter of nitrogen fertilizer and number two in phosphorus and potassium fertilizers. In 11, Daniel chapter 11 verse 35, and some of them of understanding shall stumble and fall. These are those that are weak and emunah, in faith, belief and trust, so that they may be refined, tested, purified as gold, and purged, purged from all vain traditions, malignant tongue, evil thoughts, ego, pride, the lust of the world, material, money, and be made white until the time of the end, for it is yet for an appointed time, and Moed. And yes, salvation is closer than when we first believed. The writing is on the wall. Thus says Yahuwah, he who hears, let him hear, and he who refuses to hear, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house, who have eyes to see, but see not, and who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. I pray that you see what I see, that the writing is on the wall. We have an engineered famine, war, and thirst. It's here. The word tells us that a little leaven spoils the whole lump. Those who claim that they have Messiah's blood on their hearts, on their doorpost, 
who are not keeping the feast, who are not keeping the covenant, who are not guarding their lip, who are not guarding their thoughts, are spoiling it for the rest of us. Because Yahuwah judges us first. Because we are supposed to be the lights of the world. The, yes, the harvest is great, but not so many laborers are out there. We're in the times of Noah. No one is listening about the commandments and about the feast. No one is listening. They all want to follow their religion. And those that are doing the feast, they're doing it only as rituals. They're not purging out ego, pride, or lust. They're still talking behind other people's backs. Their thoughts are not being held captive. They're also looking at opposite sex. This is a time to really get down on your knees and pray to Yahuwah that He spare us from the sword that is coming, the famine, the war, but to use us, to use us like Jeremiah or Elijah, to spread the Bezorah, to spread the good news, to turn, to make Teshuvah, to turn from their evil ways and serve Yahuwah in one consent. We are at the time of the end. And in this message, I will show you what the Father has been showing me and others where we are at in his timeline. But first, what is the year and the date in which our Redeemer of mankind was born? Emmanuel and the date Yahushua was born, there are four variables, the sheep, the shepherds, the night watches, and the Roman census. What was the Torah requirement of the daily sacrifice? It was that the sheep had to be one-year-old males without a spot or blemish. Did you know that the city of Bethlehem was famous for having perfect sheep without a spot or defect? This is why Yahushua was born there. And where did the sheep enter in to be sacrificed into the temple? The sheep gate. All the perfect sheep without spots or blemishes entered to this gate. Who entered through this gate frequently? John chapter 5, 1 and 2 tells us that it was Yahushua who entered by the sheep gate. And in this time, he went to a pool called Bethesda, which means the house of compassion or the house of flowing water. And this is where Messiah healed the paralytic man for 38 years. All the sheep that went to the temple to be sacrificed were all from Bethlehem because it was a Levite city. It was a sons of Zadok city. It was a city of refuge for the, for the Levitical priesthood. It was a city of refuge for the tribe of Levi. The Levites were dedicated primarily to raise up sheep for Yahuwah's daily sacrifice. They were working for Yahuwah. That was their work. That's what they did. Through Miriam, Yahushua had Levite blood, but more importantly, the Zadok high priest bloodline. There was an invalid man for 38 years that waited by the pool to be healed. Periodically, a Malak of Yahuwah, a messenger from Shamaim from heaven, descended and stirred up the water at the pool. And when this happened, the first person to plunge in would be healed of whatever affliction this person had. This paralytic man had failed for many years because he couldn't move. Everyone beat him to the punch. But on a high Sabbath, on the 15th day of Sukkot, Yahushua healed them because the windows of Shamaim opened up for great barakots, the great blessings. The water was only stirred up on the Moedim, on the feast. Bethesda is also called the house of flowing water. Yahushua is the living waters. And on this day of Sukkot, the Lamb of Yahuwah was sent through the sheep gate to heal this man. And this man represents Ephraim, the prodigal son, because later he told them, and sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Those that the Ruach has touched and has led you out of Babylon are Ephraim, are of the house of Ephraim. They are everywhere. But more importantly, they're in the Americas. This is where most of Ephraim is at. Micah prophesied the birthplace of Yahushua, which was Bethlehem, the house of bread. And he said, I am the living bread that came down from Shamaim. But Micah also prophesied the circumstances that were to be revealed. Who were the first ones to receive the good news of Hamashiach's birth? This verse will reveal it. 
Micah chapter 4 verse 8 and you O tower of the flock in Hebrew is called the Magdal Eder the stronghold of the daughter of Zion it shall come to you the former dominion shall come the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem now Jerusalem also represents the bride which will come into play later as we get more revelation Micah tells us that the Hamashiach the king would be revealed by the tower of the flock the Miguel Adair now King David was a shepherd and Yahushua the Messiah is the shepherd of the sheep so what time of the year were these shepherds doing their night watches and these were seasonal Luke chapter 2 verse 8 through 11 tells us in this same region the Magdal Eder there were shepherds out in the field keeping the watch over their flock by night and a Malak of Yahuwah a messenger appeared to them and the splendor of Yahuwah shone around them and they were filled with great fear and the messenger said to them fear not for behold I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people of the covenant a time of rejoicing this word rejoice and joy is always connected to Sukkot for unto you the shepherds who were Levites is born this day in the city of David a savior who is the Messiah the sovereign king now the night watches could not be in winter so the birth cannot be in winter. Why? Because it is extremely cold in that region for night watches. And it was a seasonal work. In the spring, there's too much rain. These night watches were for the purpose of Yahuwah's Moedim. They are best in the fall, late summer and early autumn. And I'll tell you why. In Acts chapter 2 verse 5, it tells us that on Passover they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Yahudim, devout men from every nation under heaven, under Shamaim. Sukkot was also a commanded feast where everyone was commanded to go to Jerusalem. And in the millennium, we are required to keep it. And Joseph ben David also went from Galilee into the town of Nazareth to Yehuda to the city of David which is called Bethlehem the house of bread because he was of the Mishpokah the house and lineage of David to be registered or Miriam his betrothed Isha his wife who was with child and now to the Roman census for Rome weather was a very important factor because they were doing it more than likely outside not much preparation needed to be done. It wasn't cold. It was perfect. Sukkot was the perfect timing. And Rome took advantage. And we continue in Luke chapter 2 verse 6 and 7. And while they were there, the time came for Miriam to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. And that word is fatne. G5336 because there was no place for them in the inn in the hotel it's important to note that Bethlehem is only eight kilometers from Jerusalem and both of these cities were packed due to Sukkot and the census this word G5336 fatne its Hebrew equivalent is Sukkah because this word fatne also means temporary shelter the Greek word for Sukkah is eskenas, which means a habitation or tabernacle. It is the same word that is used in John 1.14 and Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 and 3 in reference to Yahushua, in reference to Yahushua tabernacling with his people. And we're going to read Genesis 33 verse 17. And Yaakov journeyed to Sukkot. At this point, I want to let you know there's two cities called Sukkot. One is above Jerusalem, and this is where Yaakob journeyed to. The other city of Sukkot was when the Israelites came out of Egypt on their journey to Mount Sinai. There was another Sukkot in the wilderness, and this is the one that we're going to be referring to most. And he built him a house there, and he made sukkahs, he made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of this place is called Sukkot. Now, in the Septuagint, 
In the Breton Septuagint, it reads this way, And Jacob departs to his tents, and he made for himself their habitations, and for his cattle he made booths. Therefore he called the name of that place Booths. From reading Luke, we can understand that the city was packed, it was full. And Joseph went to this lodge, to this inn, to this hotel, and there was no more room. But the owner told him, I have no more rooms, but I have a sukkah, and you can use that as a temporary dwelling. And Joseph said, it's an emergency, I'll take it. So this man offered humbly his sukkah that he had made as a perpetual covenant that was made to us to keep. Now, which Roman months correlate with this time? It is September and October. December 25th is totally obsolete. It does not match the sequence of events. It does not correlate with this. Matter of fact, December in the Spanish is 10th, the 10th month. September is 7. The month September in Spanish is septiembre, which means 7. And Sukkot falls on the 7th month. So we know the enemy has tempered with the months because Daniel 7.25 tells us and he thinks to change times and seasons, the Moedim. And this is how he did it, through the calendars. So everyone in Jerusalem and in Bethlehem were making sukkahs outside their homes as temporary dwellings. We know that Yahushua was born on Sukkot, but which day exactly? What is the sign? What is the oath? Therefore, Yahuwah himself gives you a sign, an oath. Look, the Alma, the unmarried young virgin, conceives and gives birth to a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that is perfectly in line with Luke chapter 2, verse 12. The Malak of Yahuwah said to them, to the shepherds, to the Levites, this will be the sign, the oath to you. We have never been told this. We were just told that these were random shepherds out in the field that the Malachs just came in and presented themselves to them with the good news. No, this was all pre-planned and this was all in the spirit of prophecy to let us know that Yahushua was not born on December 25th. Someone else was born on December 25th, but not Yahushua. Yahukanan chapter 1 verse 14 tells us that the Davar Yahuwah took on flesh and made his sukkah and tabernacled, meaning he dwelt among us. And we beheld his kavod, the splendor as of the splendor as of an only begotten Ben of Elohim, the Father, complete in Yahuwah's favor and in his truth. In Genesis 1.14, it reads, And Elohim said, On the fourth day of creation, let there be lights in the firmament of the Shamaim to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, the oath, for the Moedim, for the appointed times, and for the days, and for the years. Again, we see the word signs in Genesis, in Isaiah, and in Luke. Let there be sign. Yahuwah himself will give a sign. Yahuwah gives us a sign through his appointed times of the Moedim. Yahushua had to be born on a Moedim. There's no way around that. But which day? Emmanuel will let us know. This is Isaiah 7.14 in the Hebrew. This is the word in Hebrew. And if you add every one of these letters, you will come to 197. From here, we will go to the calendar. The count towards the 197. On this slide, I have the first month on the left side and the seventh month on the right side, separated by the green arrow. How is the name of Emmanuel a sign? In numerology, his number is 197. So we will start the count. To start the new year, it is very critical to calculate the day exactly with precision. And for this case, we will use the Enoch calendar. The first day of the year starts always on the fourth day of the week. Always. The count of 197 starts on the first day of the year. 
and it ends up on the 15th day of the seventh month, which only occurs in the Enoch calendar that the sons of Zadok kept in Qumran. We will start the count on the first day of the year, the first month, and we know that Sukkot is on the seventh month. We will count 30 days times six months, and we will arrive at 180 days. Then we will add two inclinary days, and then we will arrive at 182 days. And from this point, we will count on the right side of this slide. So Yom Teruah is day 183, Yom Kippur is 192, and then we continue 193, 194, 195, 196, 197. With precision, his birthday is on Sukkot. He was born on the fourth day of the week. He was also born on the fourth millennium. And the fourth letter of the alphabet is the let. A coincidence? Absolutely not. Yahushua is the door and the bright and morning star of Revelation 22:16, which coincides with the fourth day of creation when the stars were created in Genesis chapter 1 verse 16. Second Peter chapter 1 tells us in verse 19, and we have the prophetic word made more certain which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture came to be of one's own interpretation for prophecy never came by the desire of man but by kodesh men being carried along and moved by the ruach hakodesh from yahuwah this interpretation comes from Yahuwah, not from man. As I mentioned, one of the Sukkot cities was in the wilderness, and that's the one we're going to focus. The same day Yahushua was born on Sukkot, on the 15th day, he started his ministry. So his ministry, his ministry started on Sukkot, and it went for three and a half years. And after he started his ministry, where did he go? He went into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days by the Hasatan. And that will come into play for the bride. She will be in the wilderness, but she will be protected. If we do three years, starting from Sukkot, we will end up on Sukkot. But now we're gonna count the half a year. We have 16 days here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. The 16th day is on the seventh month on the 30th day. Then you count 14 days and that should arrive at the end of his ministry. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. The 14th day of the first month on Pesach, on Passover, his ministry ended with his death. Is this a coincidence? Absolutely not. Yahuwah is revealing all things for his bride to make herself ready. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, Elohim created the Shamaim and the earth. If you know, there are five words here. In the beginning, Elohim created the Shamaim and the earth. Here are your five words. But there are two Aleph Tabs. One after created and one after Shamaim. Very important because we know that the Aleph Tav represents Messiah. He is the Aleph Tav, the Alpha and the Omega. And when they are present, that means that he is present. That means these are covenant markers. That means that he approves of this word. We're going to focus in the beginning. Isaiah tells us, Remember the former things of old, for I am Yahuwah, and there is no one else. I am Elohim, and there is none like me, declaring, making known to the Kodeshim the end times from Bereshit, from the beginning, and from the ancient times the things that have not yet happened, saying, My counsel, my plan, my purpose, my spirit of prophecy shall stand, and I shall do all my pleasure. Yes, I have spoken it. I will indeed bring it to pass. The first word that we will look at is Ba'et which is a sukkah, which is a sheepfold, which is also a house, which comes into play on the house of compassion, Bethesda, the pool, the Bethlehem, the house of bread, the house of flowing water, the living water, 
this is in the beginning in ancient Hebrew. The house correlates with being in or inside, meaning the sheepfold are to be inside, meaning that everything outside is religion and it's not of Yahuwah. We have to be inside the ba'at, inside the house, so we can be part of his sheepfold. Outside is sin, keeping you out. And the word by eight and resh together pronounce bar. And the next word is by eight, resh, and aleph, pronounced bara. So now we know that the son created and he's inside the house. The next word we're going to look at is resh, which means head person, prince, or the first. We know that Messiah is the prince of shalom, and he is the first and the beginning, the aleph and the tav. Why is the prince coming out of his tent, out of his house, out of Shamaim? Who has ascended into Shamaim and descended? Who has gathered the Ruach in the hollows of his hand? Who has bound the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? The creative word of Yahuwah, if you know it. And the word here is Yada. If you know him, he knows you. If you don't know him, he doesn't know you. The Prince of Shalom, the Prince of Princesses, the Prince of the Covenant, and the Prince of the Covenant will fulfill the Abrahamic Covenant in the Melchizedek Order in the Millennial Kingdom. And this is the reason he has left the house. He has to fulfill everything that has been written. But, however, he is leaving his home one more time. That is the plan because he is the Yod to establish his 1,000 year kingdom here on earth. That is the Father's plan. That is the Yod. He will finally fulfill Daniel 9.24 to bring in to sin and bring everlasting righteousness. And he is the spirit of prophecy and he will put all his enemies under his feet. Now he was crucified on the year 30 AD, 2000 years later, marks 2030, the year of his second coming on Yom Teruah. 2030 is a bold statement for Yahushua to return for his second coming. But is it? Before we go deeper and go into detail, let's listen to what the enemy is saying. He wants you to think that you have a lot more time than what we really have. Let's listen to the words of the synagogue of Satan and we'll get back. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Within a century or two, Earth will be dominated by entities that are more different yeah, from us for with, the first time. Uh, synthetic uh, RNA, DNA. Um, it's, really, it's like a computer program. So, I mean, I think with enough, with, with, uh, with an effort that's not too crazy, you could probably stop aging, reverse it if you want. Um, uh, these are, you can basically do it. You can turn someone into a freaking butterfly if you want with the right DNA sequence. We're developing through technology an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's, where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So, individual carbon footprint tracker. Hmm. Stay tuned, we don't have it operational yet, but this is something that we're working on. So as you can see, the enemy's planning. They're sending mixed messages, smoke screens. It's not a century or two. Iron mixed with clay is happening now. And this is going to come to fruition within the next couple of years. This is the timeline that I have. Out of all the research and praying that I've done, this is what I have. This world has been given 7,000 years from Adam to the end. We have been allotted 7,000 years or seven days. One day for every thousand years. And time started when Adam sinned. From creation to his sin was three and a half years. It was the same amount of time that Messiah had his ministry on earth. We're going to go to scripture and fill in the blanks. The seven and 62 weeks of prophecy of the coming anointed one. This will deal with the Daniel 9:24 prophecy 
to anoint the most Kodesh, the most Hakodesh, the most set apart, the most Kodesh is Messiah. The second most Kodesh is the, a place, is the compassion seat of the Ark of the Covenant because it is his throne here on earth. Daniel 9.25 Know then and understand that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, the anointed Kadosh one shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks it shall be built again with a plaza and the wall even in times of affliction even in the times of tribulation if you take time and read the book of Nehemiah you can see what all they went through to restore the wall the decree went out in 458 BC with outer Xerxes and we will read this in Ezra 7 verse 21 and I Adder Xerxes the king the king of Persia made a decree to all the treasures of the providence beyond the river the Euphrates River whatever Ezra the Zadok priest the scribe of the Torah of the Aloha of Shamaim requires of you let it be done with all diligence from 458 to 409 BC it took Nehemiah and the Israelites seven weeks with a lot of people going against them to overcome and build it with Yahuwah's help right at seven weeks from this point we go 69 weeks from 409 BC we go 69 weeks and it leads us to 26 AD but we'll backtrack a little bit because in 4 BC, the Mashiach, Yahushua, was born. And then 30 years later, he was anointed. He was anointed by Yahukanan, John, who you know as Baptist, John of the Tevilah. John fulfilled all righteousness because he had to pass the Melchizedek priesthood back to Yahushua. So he anointed him, but the Father anointed him too. He anointed him with the Ruach HaKadosh of truth. And that is the anointing that Daniel 9.24 is speaking of. If you remember in another video about the water, the spirit, and the Ruach, all three agree as one. And when the centurion stabbed him in the side, water, blood, and Ruach, the spirit, came out. It went down his body, down the cross. There was an earthquake, rocks rent, it went down the cracks. And the water, the blood, and the spirit landed on the right side of the compassion seat of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony. And that ended the third day and started the fourth day. From 26 AD, Messiah started his ministry in, on Sukkot. And his ministry ended on Passover after three and a half years on 30 AD. We have 2,000 years. We have two days. And this is what Hosea 6.2 talks about, that in two days he will revive us. Now, from his birth, if you do 2,000 years from 4 BC, you end up in 1996. And then around that time, many were waking up. But it really didn't get going till about 2008, 2009. That's when the curse of Ephraim, the punishment, it was completed. Now, from this point, if you add 2,000 years from 30 AD, you will arrive at 2030 on Pesach, on Passover. And this will mark the end of tribulation. Because Hosea tells us, after two days, he will revive us. 4 BC plus 2,000 years is 1996. And it's a fact that we are being awakened right now. But prophecy says on the third day, he will raise us up. Well, we're not in the third day yet, but sometime after we go into the millennium, this will happen. He will gather us. And after we go into the millennium, we will live in his sight. I used to think that it would be the end of the 6,000 years and then everything would change at the 7,000 years. But Father doesn't work that way. My ways are not his ways. His ways are perfect. And with Father, Yahuwah, I have learned that everything is very gradual and everything is in his perfect timing. This is going to unfold as the Father in the spirit of prophecy has already written it from the very beginning. 
Because remember, Yahuwah knew the end from the beginning. So let me conclude. We in this world are given 7,000 years from the time Adam sinned to the end of the world. And the only way we can get to tomorrow's world, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Shamaim, is only through the Mashiach, only through Messiah Yahushua. There's no other way. We have to have the mind of Mashiach, the mind of Messiah, and think in a Hebrew concept, in a Hebrew mindset, not a Greek or any other mindset, not American, not Russian, not Australian, Hebrew. But you have to allow to be flexible for the Ruach to change you, to lead you. If you object, he's going to object. You got to submit. You got to let everything go and let him lead you. And now we arrive at the bridal garments of white fine linen. Did you know that in Luke 2.12, where it talks about the sign, the oath, which deals in Passover, it talks about that the baby would be wrapped in swaddling cloths. These cloths were made out of fine linen. These clothes that he was wrapped in were leftovers from the high priest. Remember, Miriam was part of the Levites. Messiah was wrapped in swaddling cloths of the Levitical Zadok high priest. And that's how he came into the world. He was wrapped in fine linen. Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8. It tells us, let us be glad and rejoice. Remember, rejoice deals with Sukkot. And give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her, Yasharel, Israel, scriptural Israel, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Clean. The Hebrew word is tahor, meaning undefiled, unprofaned, and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the Kodeshim. That's the obedience to the author of eternal salvation. We will be priests and kings under Yahushua in the millennial reign. Now in Exodus 39 verse 27 it tells us, and they made the katunot, the garment, the robe, the tunics of fine linens, of artistic woven work for Aharon, and for his sons as Yahuwah commanded Moses. Now if you can see there are two Aleph Tavs, meaning Yahushua is present, he approves of this, and this is a covenant marker. So it was Yahuwah and Yahushua that both commanded. We receive garments of righteousness when we make a confession of belief, trust, and faith. We are to continually wash them in the blood of Mashiach by keeping and guarding his Torah like a guard does for his inmates. Because he knows if the inmates escape, he will die. So he has to guard him with his life. And that's how we're supposed to guard the Torah, his word. John chapter 3 verse 5 tells us, Yahushua answered, Barely, barely I say unto you, except a man be born again of water and of the Ruach, he cannot enter into the kingdom of Yahuwah. By being born from above, being born again of water and the Ruach, this is how you become a son of righteousness, a Zadok, in the last days. John chapter 14, 15, and 16. If you have love for me, you will keep my commandments. And I will petition the Father, and he will give you another advocate, helper in court, that he may remain with you forever. And this is the Ruach HaKadosh of truth. Now Ezekiel tells us that Yahuwah would take out the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And why was that for? So he can write the Torah in our hearts. He cannot write them on stony hearts. And then he was going to sprinkle water. This is the water that the centurion stabbed Messiah on the side and came out of his side and landed on the Ark of the Covenant. And he says, I will give you a new Ruach. And this new Ruach, this new spirit that he was going to give us, was to cause us to walk in his Torah. So if you have been born from above, if you're born again scripturally, you have received the water sprinkling and the new rock. 
and therefore you are keeping Torah and you will be able to enter into the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Now there was a certain man that snuck in and made his way in into the banquet, into the wedding feast. And nobody recognized him. No one saw him. No one noticed him. The only one that noticed him was the Mashiach, the Messiah. And Matthew 22 verse 2 reads like this. The kingdom of Shamaim, the millennial kingdom of a thousand years, and also the new Jerusalem, the new earth, tomorrow's world, may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. As I've been saying, Hasatan is usurping time, meaning many are not using this time to get ready. They're wasting their time. They're compromising. They're not using the time, the adequate time to prepare because the enemy has him busy. He's got stumbling blocks. He's got him in the matrix still. The word tells us many have been called, but few are chosen. Everyone's been called. But those that are still in the matrix, they haven't answered their call. However, the few that have been chosen, Yahuwah is dealing with them directly. They are leaving their jobs, they're selling their houses, buying RVs, they're doing whatever the Messiah, Yahushua, is telling them what to do. Now verse 3 says, And the king sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. They paid no attention. Why? Because they were not watching the times in the season of the Moedim. This is due to a few factors. One is the rapture. You're not going to get ready if you're waiting on the rapture. If you're thinking that he's going to come and save you, you're not going to prepare. Two, you're in the wrong calendar. Three, you're not keeping the feast. Or four, you're just out in the world and you have not met Messiah yet. But when the king came in and looked at the guests reclining, he saw a man there not having been dressed in a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to his servants, bind his feet and hands and take him away and throw him out into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Only the 12 tribes of Yasharel are invited to the wedding. The nations are not invited. They are not part of Yasharel. In the millennium, we will have nations outside of Israel. These are people that had perfect hearts and had a relationship with Messiah. They will be allowed to live in the nations because they didn't know Torah. So the least will live in the kingdom, but in the outer skirts, there are five areas where you can live in the coming kingdom. One is the temple. Two is Jerusalem. Three is the land of Yasharel. Four is all the nations, the rest of the nations. Five will be outer darkness, Sheol, hell. That's the last place. Those are the only options that we have. This will be the conclusion of part one. I will finish here with the requirements of a king and a priest. We need to know this. If you want to be in the millennial kingdom with Yahushua, living in his sight, you will have to know the Torah. There's no way around that one. Malachi 2.1 And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. My covenant was with him. My covenant with him was life and peace, life and shalom. And the covenant that he's talking about is the covenant made with the Zadoks, with the Levites. And he said, I gave them, I gave them life and shalom. Doesn't Messiah give us life and shalom too? Of course he does, because he's the truth, the way, and the life. And he gives us shalom. We have shalom in him. He says, and I gave them to him to fear to reverence me and he feared me and he stood in awe in my name of Yahuwah. When, he give, when we are born from above and he gives us the spirit of truth, another term for it is the law of truth. The law of truth and the spirit of truth are one and the same. So when we have the spirit of truth, we have the law of truth and it was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips. Remember Messiah will tell many, Depart from me, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity, because they were not keeping the law of truth. They rejected it. And in shalom and in uprightness, he walked with me, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should guard knowledge, and they should seek the Torah from his mouth. 
for he is a messenger of Yahuwah of hosts. The captain of the armies is Yahushua. So here, the messenger of Yahuwah of hosts is Messiah Yahushua. Now that was the commandment concerning the priest, which changes not for us in the Melchizedek order. And the same applies to the laws of a king. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 18, it tells us, It shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah in a book, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahuwah your Elohim, to keep all the words of this Torah and these statutes, and to do them. We have four Aleph Tavs here. That means Yahushua is present. He approves of this. And this is part of the covenant through Deuteronomy. And remember, he says, I will judge you on the last day for every word that I spoke. Well, he's speaking these words to you right here. We are now learning that we are to keep the commandments of Yahuwah. Because that is his loving divine instructions for his people. That he loves so much. And if we love him, we obey him out of our actions. And beloved, I leave you with part one. And I pray that this message will help you and encourage you in your walk, in your sojourning. And that you come to his Torah and learn of him. Taste the goodness of Yahushua. And he will show you and he will give you the living waters. And thank you for your time in Yahushua's name.